Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the AHP Leader podcast. Now this presentation, webinar, kind of series of conversations is all about innovations in allied health professional clinical placements. So this hopefully will provide a little bit of inspiration or maybe just ideas how you can do things differently and maybe you can increase the number of students that you have or maybe reduce some of the challenges that you face in providing practice education. We're going to have presentations from occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, radiographers, physiotherapists and allied health professional leaders who have provided leadership placements and also research placements. Please do leave any comments on the YouTube channel or head over to Twitter and just leave any comments on there. And the speakers have very kindly either spoken their email address or included it on the slides if you do want to get in touch. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Hannah Scott and I'm the practice, practice education lead for therapies at Kettering General Hospital. So since the return of OT and physio students to practice placements during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've continued reviewed and adapted the delivery of our placement opportunities. So the next slide gives you an idea of what we've been doing. We have introduced a virtual student induction. This enables us to provide students with all information relating to their placement, ensure we have shared all relevant up to date information regarding PPE, infection control, CPR and fire safety. As our students are from different universities, their start dates can differ, but this method of delivery allows us to capture pretty much all of the students coming out around similar dates. Um, within Physio, we've just successfully supported four students through two one models. We also currently have a final year Physio student trialling a clinical leadership model, which is a 50-50 split. We provide weekly student forums, which provide the students with additional learning opportunities. Some of our recent sessions have incorporated interview skills, CPD and note writing. Um, we've also started to allocate um, our students time for peer support sessions, so this can often help them if they're struggling on an element of their marking criteria or recording evidence for that marking criteria. Study days are incorporated into OT student placement hours, however we felt this was also important for our physio students and now offer this within placement hours. Feedback's been really positive and the time is used for a project or other directed study and that's often set um, by the educator in discussion with the students. All students now receive formal weekly supervision in a confidential environment that's documented. It allows them time to discuss their progress and any areas for further development. We have recently launched the student digital journey in our trust so this enables our students to have access to um, electronic systems such as vitals, care flow, patient information system and um, we're also now able to add on um, training for electronic notes as the trust is starting to roll this out. To give students an insight into other non-clinical roles we also, we'll also have opportunities for them to observe recruitment processes. And then over on the next slide I've summarised why we feel our placement opportunities are innovative and effective. So the 2-1 model has enabled us to increase our placement numbers and we feel um, absolutely be following this model moving forward in both OT and physio. To ensure the students still have some of that one-on-one -on -one time with their educator we plan in a study day each week for both students but on different days and they have a project set. Generally they work together on the project although their study days are separate. The project outcomes will then be utilised in our clinical areas, so it might be patient information or within teaching sessions for our therapy team. So recently um, some students have pulled together some teaching sessions to um, enable us to deliver them to band threes and fours within our team. Feedback today has been really positive for the 2-1 model from both educator and students. 
And then we have the clinical leadership model. So this allows the students to develop clinical skills, but also undertake some non-clinical work. So our current student is involved in some county-wide work stream meetings, enabling him to build on project management type skills. Again, feedback so far has been really positive. As a therapy team, we feel we're able to provide a range of opportunities for both our students on placement and for our therapy team. We encourage all of our teams to be involved in our students' journey from our band threes all the way up to our um, therapy team leads. And that's helping us prepare them for their future careers and our future workforce. Thank you. Um, I've added my email address on the first slide and I've also um, put on our Twitter page on the final slide if anybody would like to be in touch. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sabrina and I'm a speech and language therapist at Evelina London Children's Hospital. Today, I'll be talking about our department's speech and language therapy student placements and in particular, how we adapted our typical placement approach in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. If you'd like to chat further about anything I talk about today, or if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or my email address. Our Paediatric Acute Speech and Language Therapy team at Evelina have always enjoyed taking student placements. And at the start of the year, we accepted a spring student placement. However, as the second wave of the pandemic occurred, it became very clear quickly that we were unable to provide a face-to-face -face placement for these students. Unpredictable staffing shortages due to redeployment, increased infection control procedures on the ward, and uncertainty about what the second wave might bring made for a less than ideal environment for a face-to-face -face student placement. However, we were still eager to assist the universities in providing suitable clinical experiences for speech and language therapy students and decided to continue with the placement but in a fully virtual format. We worked closely with other trust SLT departments to share innovative ideas and advice, and we adapted our already existing departmental placement package to suit the virtual format. One of the main things that our team were very mindful of when organising this virtual placement was how to make the students feel included and welcomed without physically being on site. Therefore, we organise weekly one-to-one 10-minute video chats with each speech and language therapist in our team. This allowed the students to meet all of the therapists and learn about the diverse roles that we have across the hospital. It was a great learning opportunity and the students always gave great feedback about these chats after each one. While this seems like a very simple thing to do, it's something that we found made a big impact on the students' enjoyment of the placement. We've actually continued doing these one-to-one -one chats in our current placement, even though it's fully face-to-face. -face. One of the biggest factors that our team found challenging initially was ensuring that we were providing sufficient learning opportunities for the students' assessment criteria. Although the students attended outpatient virtual clinics and were able to observe patient interactions in these clinics, leading direct assessment and therapy was very difficult for students in this manner. Therefore, our team aimed to fill this gap by providing teaching around cases from our acute inpatient caseload. And this worked very well and allowed us to implement a structured format to the students' learning. The practice educator would collect assessment data on the ward and the students would then analyze and write therapy session plans according to this real data. The students also were able to complete discharge reports and referral reports that were also very helpful for our department. This created a safe environment for students in which they would not have been offered with face-to-face -face contacts. The virtual student placement allowed our team to come together to create a learning environment for the students. We were mindful of the students' well-being throughout the placement due to the ever-changing situation of the pandemic. The students fed back that it was great to work with each other, especially in times between clinics and meeting with the practice educator. They also stated that they enjoyed being part of team meetings and getting to know the speech therapists in the one-to-one -one chats. They enjoyed the theoretical teaching lessons and produced templates that they can continue to use in their future placements and work. And they also worked with our team, including our speech and language therapy assistant, to create a service improvement project. Currently, our placement formats have returned to face-to-face -to -face, 
However, we continue to implement some things that worked really well in the virtual format, including virtual orientation prior to placement, one-to-one -one chats with our speech and language therapy members, and inclusion of pandemic-related updates such as lateral flow testing, vaccines, and infection control procedures. Our team highly recommends hosting student placements. It provides a fantastic learning opportunity for the students and provides them with insight into future clinical roles that they might find suits them. Placements also benefit the department as it's a great opportunity for teams to work together to share teaching experiences across a variety of areas. The projects that students work on can also benefit the service immensely from creating patient handouts and resources to writing templates that might benefit future student placements and also the service. Overall, it's lots of fun and it's always very rewarding for all involved. Thank you. I have a role within research and development for occupational therapy in our service, um, but also as an associate lecturer at Cardiff University. And that puts me in a really good position to um, find placements within our organisation um, to support student education. Like many other education providers over the last 14, 15 months, we really struggled as a department to try and um, facilitate the number of placements that were required. Um, this was partly due to some of the placements that were paused or postponed. And we've had to think really creatively about how we can facilitate the, the number of um, practice placement opportunities that have been required. I'm also really fortunate because I work with some very motivated and open mind practitioners and we were able to engage with the occupational therapists in our service in terms of identifying placement opportunities that were less traditional than some of the, the previous placements that we've offered. Within my research and development role, I was able to assist one of our practitioners with supporting a research or project place placement um, that was um, really progressing a project that had been identified as a service evaluation by one of the practitioners and had been slow to get off the ground with the general sort of pressures of clinical work and the day-to-day -day, day job. Um, so we um, provided a placement for a third year critical evaluation cohort um, and a student joined the um, service to work on the project um, as well as a small amount of clinical work um, but to progress the service evaluation that had been identified as required in the in the service. I think um, we were very fortunate um, with as I said a, a very open-minded motivated practitioner um, and also um, a really sort of engaged student that was willing to try something new. We were able to bring together um, skills, so using um, my skills within research and development to help support the supervisory um, aspect of the project. Um, the student bringing their sort of early research um, skills um, and sort of, um, as I said, being motivated to learn new skills. And of course, the practitioner in terms of her exper expertise and interest in the topic that had been identified as something she wanted to progress through service evaluation. I think bringing together those skills worked really, really well. It was an excellent collaboration. I've no doubt it sort of strengthened partnerships between the university and the health board. Um, it really progressed the work to a, a point where the practitioner was just able to finish it off after the, the placement had finished and, you know, essentially that service evaluation was completed. Um, that would have taken an awful lot longer without the student's um, input. I think, you know, in terms of the skills and development, um, the, the student had a really good opportunity to gain some insight into research and service evaluation. So there's really some opportunity to develop the, the skills, the, the sort of capacity and capabilities required um, for research in our profession. Um, so really a, a very rewarding, um, successful um, placement. 
Um, and we're busy now identifying other opportunities for similar um, placement opportunities within the health boards, other sort of service evaluation and research projects that we may be able to open out to student opportunities. And I think this is definitely something that we will continue to do in the future. Hello, my name is Amanda Weaver. I'm the Therapies Early Career Lead and a physio by profession. And I'm just talking a little bit about the transformation of place-based learning that we've done at University Hospitals Dorset um, with our physiotherapy and our occupational therapy clinical placements. We started reviewing our clinical placements at, we were two different trusts at the time, so Bournemouth and Christchurch Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and Paul Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. And we were looking because of the people plan that come out, the need to increase our placements as the numbers of students increased in higher education institutes. And then obviously COVID came along that cancelled placements in our localities. It meant the placements looked quite different. We had um, student voluntary paid placements. We had virtual placements, split placements and placements with long arm supervision. We then became a merged organisation, which was the University Hospitals Dorset NHS Foundation Trust and needed to look at how we were offering placements moving forward. Also working with um, our, our Dorset colleagues from the Dorset AHP Council and the faculty to increase our capacity across the system for placements. So what we've done, we've worked with our BEAT team, which is our training team here at UHD, looking to take on some of the admin tasks, the allocation of students and supporting us with some of the paperwork parts that go out to students, also helping us to review our learning environments. And we've worked together, we had a, a six months comment from a practice educator as well and worked from um, ourselves as professional leaders at the time to go around myth busting, breaking down some of the barriers to taking students, especially with regards to part time members of staff, areas that hadn't taken students before and opportunities to look at different ways of offering those student placements. We also looked at reviewing our learning environments and looking at our models of clinical education. So we stepped away from the one-to-one -one model, looking at team approach, looking at two-to-one, three-to-one models, um, and looking at what our capacity was, rather than um, taking students in blocks, thinking about proactively thinking how much capacity we actually have in the system and how we can offer that. We've also looked at equality, diversity and inclusion issues, and this included doing a leadership placement and the student doing a project around EDI issues for um, therapy members of staff. We also offer, offer supporting learners in practice training alongside PPE training now so that we can try and cultivate a, a coaching and mentoring um, culture within our staff. So what has this meant from the work that we've done so far? So it's meant that we have increased our capacity and actually quite a lot of capacity um, moving forward in 2021, building each year. We're looking at models of placement. So as I said, team approach with a lead PPE, but then looking at two to one, three to one in different areas, looking at split area rate, um, placements as well, looking at 50-50 supported with long arm supervision from higher education, looking at virtual leadership, which would include the EDI project, but also digital transformation and project work, either the projects that we've got at the, um, at the trust or that we've got um, with the university. We've been looking at our employment data and actually we found that 65% of our physios we're employing this year actually had student placements with us. So really good reason for building our workforce and offering those placements and 22% of our OTs. We also have good satisfaction on our questionnaires that we are students and of PPEs. We're also working collaboratively much more than we ever were before to look at opportunities. So working closely with our with our um, our university providers and also within the Dorset system and we feed into the Dorset AHP faculty so that we can look at placements as a system and look at how we can support each other moving forward. So what has this meant for our students? It means that we offer a culture of learning and support, diversity of those learning opportunities and also increased quality of those learning environments. 
We found new areas for placements. We found project and leadership experience placements and virtual working as well, which basically means we can think outside the box and think in different ways to offer student placements moving forwards. If you want to, you can contact me about the work we've done at UHD, um, either on Twitter or via my work email. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Sophie Gay. I'm the Head of Practice Learning at the University of Winchester. Um, I am a physiotherapist by background, but look after all the AHP courses that we have and nursing as well. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, my email address is sophie.gay, which is G-A-Y, at winchester.ac.uk. Um, so I look after all the clinical placements for, um, for our AHP programmes. Um, and COVID has really challenged um, my role within the last year, but I think it's also given us a real platform uh, to challenge existing um, practices around um, practice learning. Um, and it's given us the chance to diversify our placement offering, challenge myths and really strip placements back um, and evaluate what they are and what the, um, where the important learning occurs within placements. Um, we are really fortunate to work with some awesome practice educators and organisations who have been really supportive of some of our crazier innovations over the past year, of which there have been a few. And I just want to run through um, some of them today. So we started doing some leadership placements back in July 2020 uh, with Beverly Harden at Health Education England. And this was done in like a split placement model. Um, where the student would uh, spend half the week with, with Bev and her team at Health Education England, all delivered remotely, and then half the team in a clinical setting that was um, also delivering care remotely. But the student actually went into the, um, the hospital to do that side of placement. Um, this was really, really successful, and the initial student that we sent there actually ended up getting some of her work published that was undertaken whilst on this placement. Um, it was really brilliant and subsequently Bev has also taken uh, quite a few more placements for us, um, often in a two to one model, so she's taken two students at a time, always in that split format, so the students are doing clinical half the time and then this leadership management type role half the time as well. Um, and this has now grown in popularity that many more people are uptaking these leadership type placements. Um, and we also have run a few more within the university in, in different settings. Um, we've also run them as split quality improvement and, and clinical placement. So half the time the students are with um, QI teams working on projects and then half the time students are in clinical settings um, or other types of projects as well, not just QI. Um, we've been putting students in research-based placements as well, education placements. Um, these work really well if they are kind of split alongside a clinical service. So that might be a clinical service that isn't able to support a student full time, or actually might be just um, a bit overwhelmed by lots of students. So actually having a student part time rather than full time might be preferable to some. So that's worked really well. Um, we've also just finished a fully simulated physio placement that saw a group of 15 first year students undertake a mainly CVR and MSK placement that used a mix of high fidelity sim mannequins and patient actors to work through a series of case studies that mimicked a patient pathway. Um, and this was really successful and students absolutely loved it. And we will hopefully be studying this and, and these students as they go forward into their next placement to see um, if their inclusion in this sim placement will actually affect their performance going forward, like they seem to think it will do. Um, we've also been really open to finding where AHPs are in the workforce um, and where they're lurking across the healthcare system and using, using this to kind of seek opportunities um, for really exciting non-traditional, often non-clinical placements. Um, so we've just had a student finish with a digital healthcare startup company run by physios, um, looking at app-based technology to support ACL rehab. And then another student just finished a placement with the experience of care team um, at NHS England. We've also supported role emerging placements. So we've just had two students working with Southern Health Trust 
um, where we place these two students on mental health wards, one OPMH, one acute forensic, um, and both they were both the only physios on that ward on a daily basis and supervised by OTs. Um, really, really successful for everyone involved. The patients benefited from the physical health expertise, the teams benefited and also the students um, did really well. Um, we found a lot of success with these non-traditional placements. Students have all been able to meet their learning objectives. Um, however, more than that, they've gained insight into the wider roles of AHPs beyond clinical practice and, and actually the value that students can bring to teams. Um, I do feel like we've entered a new era of practice learning that's going to ultimately create some excellent graduates and really strengthen our AHP workforce even further. My name is Erika Mangialardi and I'm a speech and language therapist. I completed my master course at the University of Essex and I currently work in neuro rehab in a community and outpatient setting. I founded the Aphasia Cafe in April 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And the Aphasia Cafe is a placement opportunity for speech and language therapy students. The Aphasia Cafe includes virtual communication and support groups for people with aphasia, dysarthria, apraxia, and we also accept referrals for, from people with other communication difficulties. We started only with one group in 2020, and now we have nine groups. Um, each group is formed by five participants, and um, they are run by two facilitators, which are the speech and language therapy students. Uh, the sessions are weekly on Zoom and they last uh, one hour and we do fun activities, games, quizzes, we talk about news, music, movies and we also share lots of personal and more emotional stories. Uh, the members of the Aphasia Cafe also have the opportunity to join our Aphasia Book Club, which is run by our very dedicated and experienced SAT Fiona O'Neill, and she runs this with SAT students. The sessions are on Zoom, they last one hour, and they are weekly uh, as well. In order for the participants to access uh, the book, we also offer different reading grants. Uh, in terms of what the students are gaining from this placement, uh, we see that they need to prepare session material tailored to the participants' needs. They adapt their communication skills to support the conversation within the group. They also play the role of a moderator, so they try to enable conversation among the participants. And very important, they develop the interpersonal skills, which are essential for our professions. And they do this by building rapport with the group members. Also, after the session, they reflect on their own strengths and weaknesses, and they think about future action to improve conversation within the groups. They write session notes uh, to record the progress for each member of the group, and also, very importantly, liaise with family members and the SLTs who work on a one-to-one -one, uh, with uh, the members. And this also always to support the, the participation within the groups. And um, also, we have many carers or family members that sometimes are uh, hovering in the background of, of our session, and therefore, the SLT students offer a role model in terms of um, they show how to implement communication strategies during uh, conversation. In terms of what the members uh, gain from this experience, we see, well, we can't ignore the fact that we're living, we're still living in a pandemic. So therefore, being able to join people and to talk to a bunch of, uh, of people online is definitely minimize the level of isolation. Uh, and then they have the chance to practice their communication strategies. They engage in fun and meaningful conversation with, uh, with other people. They also feel free to share their personal stories, their journey uh, through their stroke or you know um, other difficulties in a safe environment they have uh, the opportunity to socialize with other people and build friendship we have people who have been with us since last year and therefore meeting week after week they actually you know now uh, are friends and they like kissing each other and joke with each other which is very nice uh, to witness uh, and also uh, the Aphasia Cafe is very important because it gives opportunities for people who, who have mobility difficulties and, and for example they wouldn't be able to attend face-to-face -face groups and definitely last but not least uh, we have 
people from all over the world. So there are people from Australia, South Africa, uh, Europe, uh, all over the UK, and also the US. And therefore, the, the conversation about cultural differences, for example, are very, very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't have students and uh, members with me today in this talk, but I just copy pasted here some of their feedback. So if you have time, please pause the video and have a read. It's worth it. Uh, so this is the feedback from participants, this is, this is the feedback from the students. And uh, if you are a healthcare uh, professional who wants to refer uh, patients, or if you are a university tutor and wants to uh, send students of placement, please contact me on group on zoom at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter to uh, stay updated. Thank you so much. As part of our model, we take on eight students with each cohort, which allows for 56 students over the course of an academic year. Our students complete a five week placement, which is dictated by our local higher education institute, Desert University. The students are divided into pairs and rotate round in their pairs through the five acute and respiratory clinical areas within the hospital. And they spend the equivalent of 30 hours in each. The structured model incorporates guided self-directed study, formal teaching sessions, and the application of this into clinical practice. So what is expected of our students and our educators? All of our students are given a pre-placement learning pack, which has introductory theory to each of the clinical areas. The students are then expected to engage and complete the workbook activities prior to arriving at each area, which maximizes their learning opportunities this is mainly due to the time constraints associated with our learning model. Formal teaching sessions for the whole cohort provide an opportunity for our students to revise and consolidate their theory knowledge. And this encourages group based discussion around clinical scenarios. This is therefore enhanced in their clinical application of their underpinning knowledge into clinical practice. The role of our educators is to supervise our students clinically. They contribute to the theory based teaching programs and they provide detailed feedback that will support the learner to progress and transfer their skills that they're learning between each of the clinical areas. So on the screen here, we have an example of what a typical student's timetable would look like in the first three weeks of placement. On here, the student's time is split into clinical time, self-directed study or teaching theory sessions. The sessions generally include a wide variety of placement theory and skills, including general orientation to the clinical environment, respiratory specific theory, which includes assessment and principles of ventilation. And alongside that, we have some focus sessions on frailty and we run a critical care simulation session to help with Ashton's anxiety as they're only in critical care for such a short period of time it's a bit overwhelming and within this we utilise the sim man and the use of a virtual critical care environment. On this next slide we've included some resources that are incorporated within our student packs. At the bottom of the screen the blue form shows the objective matrix that we use with our students. We preset the objectives for the placement, but also give an opportunity for students to add additional objectives um, in relation to their own learning needs. This tool makes it very easy to visualise and see your progress of your student throughout the placement and as they rotate around each kind of area, what objectives are they achieving and to what level or what support is required of them. At the end of each rotation, this will be completed by the educator they're working with. And we also have a formal written feedback form that will be completed additionally. This has been created to mirror the CPAF assessment form, which is what we use currently under the pilot from the CSP. This makes it really easy for the educator during the midway and final assessment to transfer this information over into the formal assessment forms. Also on this slide, we've got a feedback um, a reflection form that we expect our students to fill out as part of the placement. And this allows them to show how they feel like they're managing on the placement and what they feel like their learning needs are during their time with us. 
So following the implementation of displacement model, we'll have increased our placement capacity by 100% this year compared with 2020. Due to the nature of the placement model, clinical educators have reported a significant reduction in what they perceive to be time spent educating students despite an increase in cohort sizes. Students praise the variety of the clinical exposure and appreciate the evidence they finish with to support their future development in CPD portfolio. And we'd just like to make clear that the success of this model is due to significant teamwork and flexibility of clinical educators at South Tees and students and lecturers at Teesside University, of which we are very grateful. That's a very brief overview of our placement model, and we're more than happy to share our resources and lessons learnt so far. Our contact details can be found on the first slide. Thank you for listening. Thanks. As part of our model. My name is Louisa Ellis. I'm one of the edu AHP education leads at West London. And I'm going to go through our clinical education and what we've been doing, how we've been doing it, things differently. So what have we managed to achieve so far? We've managed to build in some remote days, allowing some social distancing in some of our offices, split days across different services, split with leadership days for settings, having a team approach for placements and a group placement with remote days. So what are remote days here? So often remote days we set tasks for them to build their knowledge and skills and we develop, we develop to pack to add some structure to those days. We, and we're rolling them out, so that's that structure across the different settings. Often the days are learning about to manage their workload, their time management, learning the key skill of diary management, having some reflection time for remote days often is beneficial, and they, maybe possibly having a project to develop maybe student resources, uh, group protocols, and how, it's good to have a start to finish project so they can finish um, and finalise and evaluate it at the end. We've managed to achieve a split placement model and we've done a few of these, but this was an example of our first one. We had a vocational rehab service offering two days where the practice educator was set and another two days of community recovery team where there was an OT mentor and fed back to the practice educator how they, the student was doing. And I offered a day uh, as an education lead offering a leadership day remotely working on a project and offer, to, and offer time for reflection space. What is a leadership day? Leadership day, uh, key here, we finding finding a certain fixed day, provide the structure for the placement, having a set meeting every week, uh, possibly talking about a project, and um, reflection time and some mentoring sessions. The project allows us to give some focus, then develop skills and planning, implementing and evaluating something, and something to work autonomous, autonomously on during the placement. It builds skill development of communication, time management, organisation, prioritisation, and working towards a day. So the group placement model was a face-to-face -face preclinical days a week and three days remotely. The clinical days have opportunities to shadow sessions and look at notes and understand the OT process through um, clinical uh, sessions. Uh, remotely, they were able to attend meetings um, which were service-led or trust-led and to understand how the hospital worked and they had set learning tasks to understand the setting, so understanding conditions and the OT process. And I delivered some teaching sessions on topics relevant to their placement. And it was a, generally a, a one to one supervision and a three to one supervision from two of the senior OTs to deliver this model. But it really was a whole team approach to deliver the education for the six weeks. Another team approach was in, in the intermediate care setting where the practice educators possibly only available two days a week and the other two days with any other um, supporting MDT members, so OTs, PTs, um, other OT physios, nurses and paramedics and a one remote day where I delivered some tasks for them to look for their learning and some teaching sessions. 
sometimes it's a bit of a mix and match delivering um, these placements of fixing where looking at where the potentials are and matching the placement days where the opportunities are to create a whole placement. My advice is think about where the le learning opportunities are, build the placements and the opportunities. Can't stress enough the importance of planning and organising placements prior to starting and ha really having a solid induction so everybody understands the huddle and how it's going to be delivered. My name is Louisa Ellis and I can be contacted on my West London email address. Thank you so much. Draw offers during the initial lockdown. When lockdown was lifted, additional placements needed to be found to cover those cancelled at the beginning of the pandemic. Yet at the same time, services were having to reduce their offers due to social distancing requirements in teams with limited office space and capacity. The practice education team were actively encouraging placement settings to think creatively and propose possible placement projects to increase placement capacity and provide the students with meaningful practice experiences. At the same time, I was a member of the National Get There Together project group that was looking to create a digital resource to support individuals living with dementia and navigate the changes that had happened in their local community due to the pandemic. We saw so much value in the project, but we were struggling with staff resources and skills to actively contribute to the digital resource library, which we knew was going to be a huge task. So as students, we were given um, special training on how to create stories, but this next bit is a short clip explaining them how they work and how we did it, basically. Get There Together is a national project aimed at people living with dementia and their families to help them to adjust to changes in the community due to COVID restrictions. Many people living with dementia have needed to isolate or shield. Them and their families have been worried about going back into the community now the restrictions have started to lift. Digital stories are around two minutes long and using pictures, videos, voiceovers and text can help to relay important information. They can be used to highlight changes due to COVID restrictions, such as maintaining social distance, by showing examples of signs people could expect. One-way systems. They are available for specific community locations, such as shops, cafes or restaurants, healthcare services and community groups. As the videos are aimed at people living with dementia, it's important that they are accessible to all. So they will also be available in leaflet format and English and Welsh versions too. The project hopes that by using the videos, it will help lessen anxiety, reduce isolation and encourage inclusion for those individuals living with dementia. The project perfectly fitted with occupational therapy practice. So I approached Rachel and Maria at Cardiff University with an idea of supporting 10 students on placement, working in pairs in each of the five boroughs of Gwent. So in order to facilitate this exciting learning opportunity at the university, we carefully matched the students with the placement idea and identified two students to work in partnership in each of the boroughs. The placement was split three days working remotely on the Digital Stories project, with one and a half day spent in clinical practice settings with an occupational therapist and a half day study leave per week so the students had the opportunity to consolidate their learning. As part of the process and to ensure that students felt fully supported and able to share their ideas and practice, weekly peer support sessions were arranged on a Wednesday afternoon. These were facilitated by Sarah Moorcroft and Matt Harris from the Health Board, myself and Maria from the University, and um, enabled the students to develop leadership skills as they then took over leading and planning these sessions. Jenny is now going to share some of her own personal experiences of this exciting learning opportunity. So um, at the start of the placement, I was really unsure about how I'd be able to develop the skills I thought I needed to work on, especially it being my final placement. However, as the project progressed, it was really clear that this um, placement offered a really unique opportunity for us as students to take ownership of it. And as Rachel said, kind of develop our leadership, communication and teamworking skills. 
Um, and with the COVID restrictions, it was clear that the services were going to need to adapt and change to meet the needs of the service users. So it was a really fantastic opportunity to be involved in guiding and contributing to service development as it was happening. And um, by developing the digital stories, it allowed us to be involved in implementing these service changes and help give us a sense of purpose and satisfaction in our role as students. So some of the key messages emerging from this creative placement is that as occupational therapists working creatively, I think is something core to our practice. The provision of creative placements is something we all need to consider moving forward. And if you have any ideas yourselves about how you can take projects forward, then please don't hesitate to contact your partner universities to explore these ways of working because they are they bring added value to us as a university, to the students who experience the placements and to the placement providers. Thank you very much for listening to our D digital stories project.
that in the integration placement program at James Cook. Um, I felt it was a really positive placement experience. Um, we had the chance to see a variety of areas in respiratory which we wouldn't normally have the opportunity to see. Um, it really put emphasis on the importance of self-study outside of placement hours and overall we just felt really, it was really well organised and I felt really well supported throughout. Jane. Hello, I'm Jane Blakey. I'm a clinically advanced clinical practitioner physiotherapist working in Tees, Eskimo, Weir Valleys and NHS Foundation Trust, which is a mental health and learning disabilities trust. Going into this placement, we acknowledged that we had an untapped resource of Van Sevens and above physiotherapists who wanted to be more heavily involved in student placements. We also acknowledged that we needed to provide something that was COVID secure, but at the same time increasing our number of students. So our placement was a 100% virtual placement. It was delivered by Band 7s and above physiotherapists, but we also utilised a lot of um, non-professional staff. It was a 50% virtual workshops, 50% independent working, and we also developed a new model of supervision, which is one-to-one group mentorship and peer learning. Hi, my name is Annette Clark. Um, I'm a third year physiotherapy student that took part in the service development and needed placement. Um, we learned a number of things through this placement about service demand through COVID for learning disability and mental health services. Um, we felt very uh, well supported with all the time saving sessions that we took part in. We were able to interact with the service users as well, which was a unique experience compared to pre COVID times. Um, so, yeah, very well supported and well organised. If you'd like any more information, then please get in touch. clinical learning experience with the importance of a triad approach at the University of Leeds. My name is Lauren Matthews, I'm a radiographer lecturer and I'll be joined by Sarah Sayer who's also a radiographer lecturer and also the clinical coordinator for placements. Um, we will also be joined by Kieran Fox and Adam January who are both newly graduated third year radiography students with thanks to Eleanor Martin for her contributions also. We'll be discussing um, and focusing on the triad approach to learning um, which we've used to utilise innovative clinical learning. I'll hand over to Sarah Sayer, who will be discussing um, interlinking frameworks and supporting the clinical demand. Thank you, Lauren. So unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we had to adapt our learning environment for our students and withdraw them from clinical practice to support our um, clinical partnership and link in to the ability for them to finish imaging the patients with the capacity to do so. Our students unfortunately did not have the ability to undertake their clinical practice at that time so we had to look at how we altered our approach to education. And with those discussions being open between clinical and between the academic side we also linked in the students as to whether or not they would have a discussion about how we took this forward. What we came up with was a simulated assessment and we will be discussing that in a minute. Lauren will first of all discuss duty of candour. So the duty of candour are essentially um, what we mean by that is being open and honest with our students and our clinical um, colleagues in order to effectively continue the clinical placements. Evidently there have been changes and challenges that we've faced and overcome um, but in order to successfully complete our clinical placements for our students we needed to be honest with them regarding changes in policies, regarding changes in workforce and workflow. In, um, in, in a link to that what we did do at the university was build some simulated assessments which were the aim behind those was to enable our students to complete their clinical assessments in um, in a clinical learning environment without placing extra demand on um, our clinical colleagues within the trusts. So we looked at firstly our different year groups so we looked at both our first years, second years and third years at the time. Obviously our first years had had um, only a matter of weeks within the clinical placement so we were aware that they would have um, an increased need um, with regards to their clinical learning. Our second years, now our third years at the time, um, did feel a lot more prepared, but they had obviously had a lot more time within the clinical environment. And I'll hand you over to Kieran now to discuss the student perspective on that. 
Yeah, so we, as I uh, said previously, we had uh, our, lot, our placement cancelled, our summer block cancelled in second year. And what the simulated assessment meant for me personally, it meant a reaffirmation of uh, my confidence in clinical practice because we hadn't, I personally hadn't t- undertook my mobile uh, chest assessment. We'd done it uh, at Seacroft in the hospital where we went right through uh, from the steps to the patient, radiation protection, infection control, all of that. And afterwards, it also went through image interpretation. And it really felt like I w- after that, after I would been through that assessment, if there was anywhere that I was lacking, I would have been told where and we could work on that coming into placement block uh, in third year. And it just regained the confidence going into third year, knowing that I should, I am still where. I should be, despite the lack of uh, clinical practice. Our clinical educators were slightly worried that our students were not being assessed. Um, But with the discussion of putting in the simulated assessment, this allayed their fears and the incorporation of the individual action plans for each individual student allowed them to see where the students' weaknesses lay and knew where they needed some extra support for bringing them up to speed for all the clinical time that they'd missed. These were sent on to the clinical departments in preparation for their next clinical practice placement. Sarah mentioned before the importance of uh, open communication channels between the members of this triad and the traffic light system which was developed definitely allowed that honest feedback both positive and negative to be passed on. It allowed students to develop references and personal statements and allowed staff members to develop a portfolio of the educational responsibilities which they took on alongside their clinical role. It was innovative, effective and efficient. So I was also able to develop some positive working relationships through taking opportunity to be a radiography assistant at Leeds General Infirmary and it really helped develop my ability as a healthcare professional not working as a student where you've got someone to keep you correct if you fall out of line as such uh, you've got you've got to be able to be competent and be able to practice it independently and that really helped build my confidence and, and I, it was really fulfilling to be able to take that opportunity and that's something i wouldn't have otherwise being able to do and also had opportunity to practice in fluoroscopy as an assistant and it helped build a, a good relationship and good interprofessional skills uh, interpersonal skills with patients in examinations that are otherwise perhaps wouldn't have been able to take part in uh, or take as much of a role in and also um, the university also offered mock interviews uh, before uh, we had our real interviews, the real uh, interview period, and it really, really helped build the confidence uh, for when the real thing happened because we're, we'd never done online interviews. This was a completely new uh, environment for for a lot of us, and it meant if you know if we weren't happy with the first one, we were able to do a, a follow up as well. So that that really uh, helped me prepare for what was to come, and also. Uh, in terms of preparing for graduate practice, despite some assessments being removed from clinical practice, things such as uh, theatre and ICU assessments, we still had to get some unaided um, unaided examinations in our portfolio. So it was really, I uh, really appreciated being able to have the flexibility of not the, no pressure for an assessment, but have the ability to still uh, display that I can practice as a uh, practice confidently and independently as a third year student and hopefully going on to being a graduate radiographer. Kieran and I developed some professional development opportunities during the pandemic um, and I think that demonstrated that students are capable of developing such resources and opportunities both for students and professionals in healthcare Um, and they really complement the innovative clinical placement schemes which are necessary uh, during the horrific circumstances of a pandemic. Most importantly, they introduce things like advanced practice and help to bridge the gap covering some of the broadest elements of radiography and introducing, say, the four pillars of advanced clinical practice at a very early stage in students' careers. Uh, Just finally, um, the University of Leeds has developed a module called Preparation for Practice, which um, accompanied the clinical placement element of our degree. Uh, A particularly prominent part, as far as I was concerned, was an essay 
which allowed the student to explore a contemporary issue within radiography. Just finally, everyone had to be hugely flexible and adaptable to the new methods of communication necessary and the, their virtual uh, technique which was required for that. Thank you very much for listening to our um, talk. If you do have any questions, our email addresses will be on the final slide. Um, one thing that we have done here is incorporated our student voice, which in itself speaks for how effective our plans regarding clinical placement have been. Um, again, thank you for listening. My name is Rachel Hickey and I'm an occupational therapist in the adult community learning disability team in Clinton and I work for Swansea Bay University Health Board and my email address is rachel.hickey at wales.nhs.uk. I've been qualified for about 10 years and tried to take a student most years. I'm very passionate about education and training and I really, um, really value facilitating student placements. As part of my role, I was working on a service evaluation project and was approached by Laura Ingham, who's an advanced practitioner in our health board, as well as she works for Cardiff University. And she talked about uh, facilitating a research placement. And I thought that sounded absolutely fantastic, right up my street. So that was really um, where, where it started. Um, I facilitated a 12 week placement, which was during the second lockdown. Um, facilitating placement during COVID, as most of you know, not easy, but actually very worthwhile and very rewarding. Um, a research based placement was a great opportunity for both the service and for the student, and it allowed lots of self directed project goals, which worked well with remote working and gave achievable goals. In terms of positives for the service, I thought that it was really helpful to have fresh eyes on an existing project that I'd been slaving away on for quite a while. It also really helped with those time consuming aspects, so the bits of transcribing um, or even just planning and taking time out to actually carry out interviews. It was also really helpful in terms of completing the service development, which, you know, in terms of COVID and priorities, the service development was slipping more and more down the list. So that was really helpful. It was also really helpful to have um, another younger person, maybe with um, fresh eyes that was able to help me problem solve with some of the more newer aspects that we haven't come across. So arranging interviews over um, teams, which was, you know, not part of the plan. There was also some positives for the student. Um, it facilitated a really nice um, way to work at home. So it was quite project driven, self-directed and with remote working, it gave the student a purpose and a goal, which was fantastic. It was also really nice to, for the student to get experience in carrying out a practical research placement. So in terms of the pr real practical aspects, so a consent form, um, applying for ethical approval. I also thought it was a really fantastic experience for the student to gain opportunity ahead of maybe other students in their class. So th this research experience is not sort of a standard bit of experience. So I thought that's really helpful. My advice to others in terms of facilitating placement and in terms of um, whether that's now or in the near future is to really have a chat with the student and think about yourself about expectations so not comparing yourself to pre-covid placements and what you provided and um, what that looked like and similarly with the student having a chat with them about their stress levels um, when i think back of placements and you know we've all been there placements are one of the key points really in in our studying that are, are quite stressful so i think it's really important now with this added layer of covid is to be kind to ourselves and be kind to the student hello my name is dr lisa taylor i'm an associate professor in occupational therapy and associate dean for employability from the university of east anglia and you can see my contact details at the bottom if anybody has any questions after this presentation I'm here to present the peer enhanced e-placement PEEP that I created this time last year in response to COVID suspension of face-to-face -face placements. The original PEEP was 
delivered entirely by the academic team at the University of East Anglia, but over the last year has evolved to be a collaborative um, approach with placement partners um, and the academic teams within the higher education institutes to develop and deliver the PEEP, enabling students to link into the um, placement environment via an online link um, in, in the way that we weren't able to do in the original PEEP. So as you've gathered, the PEEP is delivered entirely online. But what is crucial about the PEEP is that the existing placement learning outcomes remain the same and all of the paperwork, the normal assessment processes, etc., all remain the same, but it is delivered entirely online. The key to the PEEP is the peer collaboration, the students work in groups as well as individually. It makes this placement accessible for students wherever they are in the world and whether they've got existing problems that means that they can't actually have a face to face placement. There has been equivalence of placement learning outcomes demonstrated by the implementation of the PEEP from the feedback that we've had from the students who have experienced the original PEEP and subsequent PEEPs. The in-depth professional reasoning that is developed through this model has been um, really valued by the students. There is scaffolding, structure and pacing within a PEEP to encourage that learning journey for the students working towards their placement learning outcomes. Case studies, simulations and scenarios, live links into the placement environments, as I've talked about, that have been developed over the last year, enable the students to manage a caseload as they would do or manage scenarios as they would do in the face to face environment. But this is enabled and facilitated through the online placement environment. So I've worked with Julie Salmon, uh, Professor Julie Salmon, who is um, an expert in online teaching and learning to enable wide, wide scale adoption of the PEEP. We've developed a PEEP acquisition package and have worked with 63 course teams across the UK, enabling them to adapt and adopt the PEEP for their own students. This work has covered 20 health and social care professions fields I've listed down below and the planned placements that the participants have uh, reported, if they all put those into practice, will mean that 13,000, over 13,000 weeks of placements have been created through our work with the placement teams over the last year. I've put a link at the bottom of this slide that will give you more information around the PEEP, but if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Welcome to our presentation on the Occupational Therapy 2 to 1 Peer Assisted Learning Placement delivered at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. I'm Jermaine Chandler, the MSc Pre-Registration Occupational Therapy Course Director, and I'm here with my colleague Dr Lisa Taylor, Associate Professor in Occupational Therapy and Associate Dean for Employability. My contact details are included below if anyone has any further questions. And a big thank you to the Elizabeth Casson Trust for their funding for this project. So the Occupational Therapy 2 to 1 Peer Assisted Learning Placement came about due to the suspension of placements in the summer of 2020 due to COVID-19. This created the need for our MSc Year 1 and 2 Occupational Therapy students to attend placement at the same time in September 2020 in order to allow them to progress their programme within the expected time frame. This is unusual for our programmes as we ordinarily plan placements to avoid any overlap for cohorts to help manage placement capacity. We therefore needed to think differently about how to deliver these placements. This resulted in the PAL model. So this was established so that the two students, a year one student and a year two student, could be paired with one educator. The year two student was in the role as the mentor and the year one as the mentee. The project was developed through extensive collaboration between ourselves as UEA academics, our students and our local health and social care partners. Full evaluation was possible thanks to the Elizabeth Casson Trust funding, which enabled a research assistant to be employed. So the findings were split into student perspective and educator perspective and were overwhelmingly positive from both. The students reported that it was a mutually beneficial experience for them. It wasn't just the mentors who benefited, the mentees benefited. There was a shared learning experience between the two students. It enabled them to problem solve together 
and they provided emotional support for each other. Their confidence was increased and their learning experience was enriched by working together. Their employability attributes around leadership, delegation and supervision were reported to have been developed in ways that otherwise hadn't been developed in a face to face one to one placement. From the educator perspective, there was initial anxiety. This was a new model of delivery and there was the initial anxiety of having two students on placement at the same time, not only in the same cohort, but different cohorts. But again, there was overwhelmingly positive response from the educators saying that it was just as, if not more efficient than usual placement provision. And that was reported by 88% of the educator respondents. They reported increased self-sufficiency of students that en enabled informal discussion, reassurance and asking silly questions between the students themselves. And the students settled and became more autonomous more quickly. 90% of students and educated recommended the, this type of placement model for other occupational therapy students. And 91% of students recommended this type of placement for other healthcare students. If you have any further questions on this, please do refer to the contact details on the first slide. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Soraya Hassan. I am professionally the physiotherapy working in Leicestershire Partnership Trust. I'm also the clinical placement expansion project lead. Um, in Leicestershire, we are finding the highest demand for placements is for physiotherapy. So in May, we ran two leadership placements um, for four physiotherapy students from the University of Leicester. It was two by two placements. One was a strategic leadership placement and one was a more operational placement. We had really good support from the local university um, as we were trialing a new placement model and the HEI selected the students and also worked with um, ensuring the marking criteria and assessment reflected the students' experience of this type of placement. On the induction day, the first day, they completed leadership behaviours training, our trust leadership behaviours training. So they had an expectation of what the behaviours needed to be, but also what they could expect of others that they would be coming across during this placement. The placement did include them spending time in clinical areas. They uh, were both profession specific as well as multidisciplinary, and they were provided with the contact names for these services and the students were left with the responsibility to make their own contacts independently for these services and set up when they were going to see uh, who um, and which particular services they wanted to spend time with. They also had project topics that were set with their clinical educators. Um, the one looked at the triage process for therapy within domiciliary services, including Home First. And the second project title was the management of falls in care homes. At the end of the placement, the students had to present their uh, projects and they could use any format that they wanted to. But it was really fantastic. Uh, they were able to demonstrate what they had learned and they were also able to highlight um, how practice can be reviewed post this placement. The reflections from the educators and the students after their placements were that they felt that this was more appropriate for a year three students. Interestingly, the four students on this placement that we trialed were at the end of their second year. Um, they really, really enjoyed having the opportunity to spend time in clinical areas. Um, and though it was a two to two model, they did link in with one particular, particular clinical educator. Um, each so that they could discuss their own individual learning needs, which they all found productive and supportive. They would have liked a bit more face-to-face, -face, which after the first day of induction, they didn't have that much face-to-face, -face. but with the decreased footfall in basis, that was a challenge with COVID, um, but we anticipate that we will be able to accommodate more of a weekly face-to-face catch-up where they can harness in a bit more on their individual requirements and utilising the remainder of the placement to support them achieving their individual objectives of the placement. Thank you. My name is Christine Samuel and I'm an occupational therapist working for Swansea Bay University Health Board. At the time of the placement last October, I was the clinical lead for the rheumatology service. The placement was a leadership placement for a final year BSE student from Cardiff University. This kind of placement was a first for the occupational therapy service 
Leadership placements should concentrate on service improvement and evaluation. They're suitable for students who have experienced a range of placements and are ready to take on a new challenge. The student who is identified by the university academic team had demonstrated the appropriate skills for this kind of placement. When I was asked to host the placement, initially I felt some trepidation. Some of the concerns that came to mind were, would the student be able to meet their learning outcomes? Our service was operating almost completely virtually. How would this work in practice? How would I monitor the student's development? Would the experience be worthwhile for the student? How would their well-being be, be affected by working in isolation? The student worked with me on a service improvement project to develop an expert patient programme specifically for patients with fibromyalgia. The project involved critical, critical evaluation of several elements, including gaining patients' perspectives, the team's views, and working collaboratively with Public Health Wales and the third sector. The student was able to utilise his skills in research, data collection and analysis. We had regular meetings to discuss progress and set goals each week during su supervision. In addition, the student developed his clinical skills by carrying a small caseload and conducted appointments virtually using the video platform Attend Anywhere. He was able to initially shadow therapists and was then observed completing assessments and in the final stages of the placement conducted assessments independently. Despite occasional network problems, conducting appointments virtually was comparable with face-to-face -face contacts. In terms of note writing, he had recently introduced a secure electronic documentation system and the student shared his notes with myself and other therapists. In terms of exposure to strategic and leadership roles, the student had the opportunity to meet with senior staff in the service and this enabled him to develop his professional and leadership skills. Throughout the placement, I had daily contact with the student to set timelines for carrying out various stages of the project, weekly supervision to set goals for the next week, reviewing progress, a detailed learning contract to monitor development. Self-directed learning was encouraged and the student was able to schedule additional learning to aid his progress and reflect on experienced experiences to maximise his development. Due to the fact that he was lone working, I checked regularly on his well-being. During team meetings, we shared tips for mental well-being and at the end of the placement, we had a team well-being event. Looking back at feedback from my student, he felt that it had been a unique learning opportunity and gave him invaluable experience. Despite the fact that it was an unfamiliar way of working and a new way of learning on placement, he was able to use the transferable skills that he had developed in previous placements to ensure that he achieved his learning ob objectives. By engaging in the leadership development opportunities, he was offered on this an inner to the placement, he gained a better understanding of effective leadership principles and became more self-aware of his own leadership style, including being able to identify leadership aspects he wished to develop, further develop himself. My contact details are christine.samuel at wales.nhs.uk if anybody wants to get in contact. Thank you. So that's the end of the presentations. Thanks so much for watching. If you've got any questions, please just leave them below or DM me on Twitter at HPVDare. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who presented.